the value type is defined in Plutus Ledger API in module plutus.v1.ledger.value. Note the one here. I mentioned in the beginning that in this course we will use Plutus version 2, but the value type hasn't changed from version 1 to version 2. So even in version 2, we are still using the old value type from version 1. So this is correct that we are in v1 here. There is no plutus.v2.ledger.value. We look at the definition of value. We see it's a new type wrapper around a map from so-called currency symbols to another map from so-called token names to integer. This looks a bit strange, but we'll understand how it works very soon. The first thing to notice is that a token or a coin on Cardano is given by a currency symbol and a token name. So this pair, the combination of currency symbol and token name, defines a token. If we look at currency symbol, it's in the same module here right at the top. That's just a new type wrapper around a built-in byte string. And the same is true for a token name. That's another new type wrapper, again, around a built-in byte string. And because this combination of currency symbol and token name is so important, there's even a type for that. It's called asset class. And it's a new type wrapper around a pair of a currency symbol and a token name. So an asset class defines a native token, including ADA. So ADA is a specific asset class, and all native tokens are different asset classes. Actually, here you can see that there is a value ADA symbol of type currency symbol. And if we look at token name, there's ADA token of type token name. So the ADA asset class is given by the pair ADA symbol, ADA token. And as it so happens, they are both wrappers around the empty byte string. So the empty byte string currency symbol is the ADA currency symbol and the empty byte string token name is the ADA token name. So if we look at the definition of value again, note that a map from currency symbol to a map from token name to integer is the same, is isomorphic to a map from asset classes to integer. So it's easy to see that such a nested map is the same as a map from pairs of currency symbol and token name to integer. And we know a pair of a currency symbol and a token name is just an asset class. So the meaning of this type is we have a map from all possible coins, all possible tokens, to an integer. And the interpretation of value of this type is just that it says how many coins of a given type are contained in a given value. So for example, if we had 100 ADA, then in this map there would be an entry at the ADA symbol. And in this nested map, there would be an entry at the ADA token name and the value would be 100. And this type allows to combine different tokens, basically a bag of tokens in one value of type value. Let's open a REPL and let's import the module that defines values. Now, in order to work with values, we must inspect a given value to see how many tokens of a given type asset class it contains. And we, of course, must be able to construct values. So for construction, we have the function asset class value. Given an asset class and an integer, it constructs the value that contains so many coins of this type. And how do we get an asset class? There's a function asset class given a currency symbol and a token name gives us an asset class. So for example, I could define ADA as asset class 
ADA symbol and ADA token. Okay, this is how it's textually represented. So to, for example, define the value of 100 ADA, I can now do, and I get a value representing 100 ADA. So we see it's this nested map. The ADA symbol is the empty byte string. That's why this looks a bit funny here. And the ADA token name is the empty byte string. And here we have 100 million. So 100 ADA is 100 million Loveless. If I give this a name, then I can use the asset class value of function. But given a value and an asset class gives me how many coins of that type are contained in that value. So let's try this with our value from before and the ADA asset class, and I get my 100 million back. So this shows how we can get ADAs. Let's try with a different token. And to work with that, it's easier to activate the overloaded string extension again, which allows us to use string literals for built-in byte strings, but even for currency symbols and token names, because currency symbol and token names also are instances of class is string, which means I can use literal strings to define values of those. For example, I could define a native token value doing asset class value, asset class, and now I need currency symbol and token name, and I just do something arbitrary that won't make sense, but it doesn't matter at this point. So just some hex string. Normally it would be longer, but for demonstration, let, let's take a short one like this, and some token name. And let's take 77 of this. So now we have another value where now we have different entries. So now we have the token name here in the outer map and the entry, the inner map, my token and 77. So how do I combine values? How do I create values that don't just contain one token, but several tokens? If we look at information for the value class, we see that in particular it implements monoid. So what's a monoid? It's a very important and common class in Haskell. And we see that a monoid is in particular a semigroup. A semigroup that in addition has this memty field. So what's a semigroup? It's a type class that defines this operator to combine two values of type A to a third value of type A. The most basic example of a monoid is lists. And in the case of lists, this operator is list concatenation. So we know strings in Haskell are just lists of characters. So for example, I can do Plutus Pioneer and using the semigroup operation here, which is concatenation in the case of lists. So concatenating this list of characters with this list of characters gives me that list of characters. And memty is the neutral element in a monoid. So the element that if I combine it with another element of the monoid doesn't change that element. So in the case of lists, that's the empty list. In the case of strings, it's the empty string. So if I concatenate the empty string on the left or on the right with another string, it doesn't change that other string. Another example are from arithmetic. So if we import data monoid, there is, for example, the sum monoid, which is just a new type wrapper around an A, so some A is just A. So it is normally used for numeric types. So here we see if 
A is a numeric type, then sum A is a semigroup. And the idea is that for numeric types, for num types in Haskell, we have addition and multiplication. And actually both can be used for a monoidal structure. So the sum new type wrapper is used to indicate that we are interested in addition. There's also another one for multiplication. So for example, what I can do is sum seven type int bind with sum three, and that gives us 10. So integer addition is used in this sum monoid. There's a, another monoid, as I said, for multiplication. It's called product. So if I do the same with product, I get 21. So in that case, the multiplication is used to define the monoid structure of product. So what's MEMT in these cases? So the neutral element of addition is zero. And unsurprisingly, the neutral element of multiplication is one. Okay, so value is a monoid. So in particular, I have MEMT. And that's just the empty map. So that's the zero value. And the semigroup operation is given by addition of values. So I had my value V first, the 100 ADA, and I had this other value. And now I can use the monoid operation to add the two. And now I, for the first time, see a value that doesn't just contain one coin, but two. So it has two entries, one at the ADA currency symbol, one at this made up currency symbol. And so this represents the value of 100 ADA and 77 of my made up native token. Let me give a name to this custom asset class I defined. And let's also give a name to the sum of the two values. Now that we have seen how to construct values by using asset class value and the monoid operations, the next operation we need is to analyze the value, to extract how many coins of a given asset class are contained in a value. That can be done with asset class value of. So given a value in an asset class, this tells me how many coins of that asset class are contained in the value. So if I try that for W, first with the ADA asset class, I get my 100 million back. And if I do it with this other asset class that I called AC, I get the 77. If I do it with an asset class that's not contained in there, let's just make one up, I get zero. If we look at the value type again, and its instances. We see there are all sorts of instances here. And another interesting one is group, because that allows us to also subtract values. So that's defined in Plutus TX dot monoid. So we can try this out. So let me import that module as well. And now we have, for example, inf for inverse available and also this G sub. And we can try it out. So recall our value W. And we can now, for example, subtract 10 ADA from that by doing G sub W. And now, and we end up with still 77 of these custom token but now only 98 are left. If we go back to the documentation, we see there are other operations as well. For example, you can compare two values, greater or equal, greater than, less or equal, less than. Note, however, that this is a so-called partial ordering. So two given values don't necessarily have to be comparable. With numbers like three and seven, you always have one of three cases. Either the first is less than the second, or they are equal, or the first is greater than the second. 
with values, that's not necessarily the case. So you can have two values where neither of the two is greater or equal than the other one. For example, if you have a value of 10 ADA and a value of three coins of some custom token, then none of the two is greater or equal than the other. So greater or equal means that for every coin, the amount of that coin contained in the first value is greater or equal than the amount of that coin contained in the second value. And similar for the other three comparison operations. Finally, you can check whether a value is zero. And there's the splitting into a positive and a negative part, union with, and this one is also interesting, flatten value, where you can convert the value, which is this nested map, a map of maps, into a flattened list, a list of triples with currency symbol, token name, and integer. So we can try out this one for our value W, for example. And we get a list of two triples. The first triple is ADA symbol, ADA token name, 100 million. And then this custom symbol, custom token name, 77. Now the question, of course, is why? Why do we both need a currency symbol and a token name? Why don't we just use one identifier for an asset class? And this is where so-called minting policies come in. So the rule is that, in general, a transaction can't create or delete tokens. So everything that goes in also comes out. The exception is the fees. So there's always a fee in Loveless that has to be paid for each transaction. Fees depend on the size of the transaction in bytes, not in value, and on the scripts that need to be run to validate the transaction. And the script takes more fees if it consumes more memory and if it needs more steps to execute. So, but if that was the whole story, then of course we could never create native tokens. And this is where minting policies come in and where the relevance of the currency symbol comes in. So the reason that the currency symbol, the byte string giving the currency symbol has to consist of hexadecimal numbers is that that is actually the hash of a script. And this script is called the minting policy. And if we have a transaction where we want to create native tokens or burn them, then for each native token that we try to create or burn, the currency symbol is looked up. That's the hash of a script. So the corresponding script must also be contained in the transaction. And that script is executed along with the other validation scripts. And similar to the validation scripts that we have seen so far that validate inputs, the purpose of, of these minting scripts is to decide whether this transaction has the right to mint or burn tokens. And ADA actually also fits into this scheme because remember the currency symbol of ADA is just an empty string, which is not the hash of any script. So there is no script that hashes to the empty script. So there is no script that would allow the minting or burning of ADA, which means that ADA can never mint it or burned. All the ADA that exists come from the Genesis block, the Genesis transaction, the very first transaction, and from monetary expansion. So after each epoch, when rewards are paid, part of those rewards come from so-called monetary expansion, where a certain percentage of the remaining reserves gets paid as rewards. And the total amount of ADA in the system is fixed. It can never change. So only these custom native tokens can have custom minting policies and can be created and burned under certain conditions. So we'll look at an example of a minting policy next and see how it works and see that it's very similar to validation scripts, but not identical. 